Hey everyone, this is Tori and today we are doing something a little special. We just reached 100 subscribers for the channel. Yes! <laughs> I wanted to thank you guys so much for supporting me this way and so I wanted to do something a little special. And some time ago I had asked uh, you uh, what you would like to see me do if uh, the channel ever reached 100 subscribers. Um, not many people answered, but someone said that they would like to see me react to a fanfiction. So, uh, I thought maybe I should react to a Centaur no Naomi fanfiction, since that was what I was reacting to at the time. But, well, things changed, and, well, what really pushed the channel uh, over the, uh, um, the, uh, 100 subscribe limit was, um the Steven Universe uh, reaction that I did yesterday. So, um, I'm going to react to a Steven Universe fanfiction. Um, I didn't really I didn't really know what I would react to, uh, so I just uh, decided that uh, I would react to a finished fanfiction on Archive of Our Own. Well, I would take the one that has the most kudoses. Kudos? Kudoses? How do you say that? I don't care. The first, first one was a Lapidot fanfiction and, well, let's just say I'm not that fun of Lapidot. If you want me to to, um, to react to a Lapidot fanfiction, I can do that, like, another time. Uh, but for now, I decided to start with a, uh, well, a fanfiction that had no real shipping in it. Uh, and it's called uh, Little Rebellions. Uh, written by Completely Different. N nice, uh, <laughs> nice pen name. I like it. Um, and apparently it's about, uh, pearls. Like, pearls in general. And that's nice because, well, Pearl is one of my favorite characters in the show. Like, probably the character I relate the most to. Um, but, yeah. Anyway. Uh, so here we're going to react to, uh, Little Rebellions. Okay, so here's the summary. Not all pearls have the chance to run off to another planet and take up arms. Not like our pearl. Not all fights are grand and romantic. These are the Little Rebellions. Little, but just as defi defiant. If you don't know, guys, I'm French, and sometimes the pronunciation isn't that easy, um, uh, in English. Author note, I like pearls a lot, and I have a lot of different ideas about pearls that I want to write about, but unfortunately, neither the time nor the patience to string together a coherent plot about them all. So here's what I'm going to do instead. A collection of one-shots about each about or from the, the perspective of a different pearl, or pearls, looking at the different ways they cope with the shit hand homeworld has dealt them. Yeah, I like the idea. Let's get to this. All right, chapter one. Light gray pearl and purple pearl. Purple, purple pearl. Okay, so here we have a pearl uh, who belongs to a calcite. Calcite, calcite. And it's a very important gem. Nobody is watching calcite's pearl posted in the back corner. Nobody aside from the other pearl. This one is pale purple with her gemstone at the side of her head, half covered by hair. Pearl does not know who she belongs to. She is bored, but hiding her boredom in the expert way that only a fellow Pearl could. Pearl catches the other's eye, glances towards Calcet, still blabbering on, and even though it is risky, she opens her mouth. No sound comes out. Instead, she opens and closes it in the pantomime of her master. <laughs> Discreetly, she mirrors the movements with one of her hands. Open, close, open, close, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> I can just picture it. The purple pearl cannot react, not openly. But the light gray pearl catches a slight wrinkle around her eyes, a, twi a twitch of her mouth. She is snickering on the inside. At least they're stuck in this tedium together. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> that was a really cute scene. <laughs> I can just imagine the very important gem, you know, being like, ah, oh, yeah, so this and this and that, talking about very serious matter, and just the, the pearl behind her being like, 
The chapters are kind of are kind of um, short, aren't they? Chapter two, Mate Green Pearl or Made Green Pearl. Mat, I don't know. Pearls are always listening. So this one belongs to a gem named Chrome Diopside. I don't know what the actual gem gem looks like. Ooh, and she comments pear dots. Yay. <laughs> nice. She knows every little thing that her chrome D upside has known in the past 17 centuries. Every bribe she has taken, every lie she has told. I'm going to guess that was a typo. Typo. Um, every lie she has old doesn't make a lot of sense, but I, I'm guessing she, it says every lie she has told. Every mistake she has swept under the rug. Ooh, clever Pearl. Pearl has never said anything. She is not stu stupid. She knows the fate of a disloyal Pearl. But at the same time, she knows that fate is the fate of all Pearls, eventually. Sooner or later, she will be shattered, or harvested, or replaced. Perhaps it will be due to an insignificant infraction on her part. Perhaps she will simply be considered obsolete and replaced with a sleeker model, who too will be replaced in time. So here is the clever part. Pearl has a coded has coded a subroutine into her secret account. If Pearl does not check into it for a full five cycles, that routine will activate automatically. Every single file she has uploaded will be automatically forwarded to Chrome D of Sides advisors. There will be secrets no longer. Wow, clever. Well, yeah. <laughs> if Pearl dies, her master will die too. The knowledge fills her with a sense of satisfaction. It's a grim kind of satisfaction, but that is the only kind she has. Welp. Well, you have to admit, you know, knowing that you could be replaced or killed or, or you know, that you don't have your own fate in your hand must be really difficult. Yeah, it makes you think about what, you know, what pearls actually, you know, deal with back on Homeworld. I, I really wish the show, uh, you know, tells us a little bit more about this, um, you know, in canon. Because we don't know a lot about Pearl's past. Like, we, we you know, uh, since she, there was this thing where she covers her mouth every time she wants to say something about Homeworld. Or, not exactly, but yeah. People have speculated about this after the uh, uh, episode, uh, Gem, uh, Gemcation? Yeah, Gemcation. Uh, anyway. Chapter 3. Mocha Pearl. One gem's trash is another gem's treasure. Ooh, someone's going to go scavenging. Scavenging? Is that how you say it? Whatever. Pearl spots it as she, walk through, as she walks through the busy construction hub, trailing behind her master just out of the corner of her eye. Something small, something shiny. It's lying in the shadow of a half-constructed escape pod. Pearl does not know what it is, but she wants it. <laughs> Ooh. That Pearl likes shiny things. <laughs> that want is sudden and intense and dizzying, but before she can even analyze it, she's already moving forward. Walk fast, cross the floor, hold head high, lose fake confidence, don't let anyone question, duck. Something cold and jagged in hand, she hides it in her palm, straightens, returns to her spot a few strides behind her owner, acting as if she never left. Her master, Rutile Topaz, is carrying forward, not having noticed a thing. Yeah, that's good. Nobody nobody um, actually pays attention to what she's doing, so, she, so she's taking that to her advantage. That's nice. Pearl continues forward, trying to pretend that it doesn't feel as if the illicit object is burning in her hand. I really like this sentence. <laughs> what did she take, though? It seems to be a piece of broken debris made of some kind of modern construction material. It is the shape of a rough scalene triangle, almost like a knife, Pearl thinks. 
and the thought is so illicit it makes her shiver. <laughs> she nearly drops it. It is not a knife, she tells herself, although the two sides are so sharp and jagged that perhaps it could serve that purpose. Ooh, I see what, where are you going here. It does not have the heft that Pearl would expect of a knife, however. It is light, thin, smooth on one side, rougher on the other. It is pale metal metallic green, but if she tilts it, other colors sh seem to shimmer under the surface. Blues, pinks, purples, reds, orange, silvers. The colors dance brightly against the brown skin of her hand as she turns it to and fro. It kind of reminds me of that, uh, you know, that weird metal in, um, in uh, His Dark Material from Philip Pullman? Read it. It's a really good book. Series. Yeah, series of books. Ooh, okay. Very nice passage here. Pearl has always liked her brown tone. She has always appreciated how it matches the brown veins of colors of color that streak across her master's otherwise white skin. It is a very satisfying shade. It feels very grounded, warm. But everything about her is brown. Brown skin, brown hair, brown eyes, brown top, brown dress, brown shoes, everything, brown. It's the same for everyone, of course. Nobody bears more than a few colors or shades. Even the diamonds dress only in tones of a single color. But this, this thing, it's rainbow. It is every color at once. Ooh, I really like this passage. She's going to store it in her James in her gemstone. Ooh. Thanks for all that wonderful sp feedback, everyone. Seems that Maddie Green really struck a chord, which I appreciate. She's probably my fave I've come up with yet. And I've got like 10 of these things already in first draft, so there's a few. But seriously, the comments are all wonderfully encouraging. I'm not sure which chapter I like more between uh, this brown pearl that hides what could be in a weapon in her own uh, uh, outfit uh, and um, and um, Matty Green in the Matty Green Pearl who programmed literally programmed the death of her own master if she ever came to die herself. These are really nice and clever little one shots. I really like it, and I feel like it would be nice if it would if it was a. Um, if it, you know, if it was a, an actual fanfic with chapters and a, and a singular plot, but, but this actually feels pretty real, you know? Um, feels, of course. I, I'm not saying this person is on the crew universe or anything, but this is really, it, this is really good. Chapter 4, Community. Are we going to see several pearls in that one? Communication is not limited to speech. Nobody ever touches pearls, aside from other pearls, and then always in private, always from watching eyes. These touches are quick, fleeting. A brush of hands, a bump of arms, fingers fluttering against the cheek, a gentle weight on a, sh on a shoulder. Quick as they are, they say things the pearls would never dare speak out loud. They say things like, Hello, I see you. Watch out. Be careful. Step lightly. Change course. Good luck. Be brave. I'm sorry. I will remember you. Goodbye. That was one of the shortest shot uh, one shots for now, but that was okay. That was that was actually very powerful. I don't think that would be how uh, it would actually be on Homeworld. Like, we have seen Pearls, you know, uh, talking and, uh, well, it was only the Diamonds Pearl. But we have seen, uh, we have seen them, you know, interacting with the Diamonds. I, I'm not sure it would be, you know, that, uh that we are to have them, you know, talk to each other. But maybe that's actually the case. 
And anyway, that was pretty nice. Chapter 5, Fuchsia Pearl. It's not exactly romance, but it doesn't need to be. Ooh, are we going to talk about uh, a pearl that's in love? Nobody ever touches pearls. Nice. Nice reference to the previous chapter. Carrite, 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 charrite was visiting her master for one reason or another. Pearl wasn't sure. She hadn't, she hadn't been paying close attention. When some memo came up and her master bustled out of the room to attend to it. It had just been, it had been just her and Charite left alone in silence, waiting. Until Charite had covered the distance between them in a few smooth strides, surveyed her up and down and then said, You are a pretty thing, aren't you? Mm. Charite had observed her observed her for several several long moments more, her bright eyes really looking, noticing, not just sliding off of her like everyone else's. Then she reached out a hand to Pearl's shoulder and stopped, hovering just a few inches above, above the skin. May I? No would have been the correct answer. Cararites are warriors, which garners them respect, of course, but there are no quartzes. They are smaller, swifter, meant for infiltration as opposed to head on battle. They are lower ranking than Pearl's master, a purple sp spinal, spinal, who would not want her property so sullied by the hands of a soldier. If Pearl had said no, this Karite would have been obligated to back away. Of course, Karite is far larger than Pearl and much stronger, so there's not much she could do to resist. But there was something on this Karite's face that made Charite's face that made Pearl think she, that she should, that she would back away if asked. Maybe it was for that very reason that Pearl nodded. And so Charite had reached out and brushed her fingers lightly along Pearl's shoulder. The, ch the touch had been brief, quick. Neither had wanted to risk being caught, but that had only been the first time. Charite had been sent on visits to Purple Spinal, to Purple Spinal's quarters again and again, and sometimes she would be left alone, not often, but enough, and they would touch. In small ways, of course, at first Charite had been light, gentle, as if admiring her exquisite form, tracing the soft cur curves of her face and Pearl's arms. Then those touches had become a little more firm, squeezes and presses. Pearl liked those, even though they scared her a little. Charite was a... Charite? Is it Charite or Charite? Char Char Charite was a warrior. One who could destroy her physical form with a single squeeze, and she liked feeling that power and knowing that Charite would not. Not long after that, Pearl began reaching out to Charite herself, tracing her form the same way she had traced hers. She was strong and lithe and mus musc musc <laughs> muscular. Oh my gosh. <laughs> then came the embraces. Charite pulling her in, wrapping her arms around her, tucking her under her chin like she fits, like she belongs there. Oh my gosh. <laughs> She doesn't. Pearl knows this. She is not Charites, and Charites is not hers. No matter how much they sometimes pretend otherwise. Pearl knows nothing of romance. She has never heard love stories or their ilk. If she were to hear them, she would probably flinch away from the idea of having the concept applied to her. She does not love Charite, not precisely. She likes that Charites is different. She likes that Charite appreciates her in ways she's never been appreciated before. She likes feeling another gem's body pressed against her own. She loves the... She loves the game of it, the escapism. She loves knowing how much her master would detest it if she knew. This was very interesting. Oh, wait, there's, an, there's a note. 
The idea for this piece popped into my head at around the same time as the previous one. I wanted to explore the concept of gems touching gems, considering how big a thing it seemed to have been based on the answer. I really like the idea that touching between casts, especially if there's a big gap in their ranking, is seriously taboo. Not only is it sufficiently shitty for Homeworld, it almost makes it all the casual touches between the crystal gems all the sweeter. True. True, I agree with this. Um... Okay. This, uh, this part, this chapter right there, was very interesting, and I feel like it had a lot of, um, of thought behind it. Because, yeah, it is, it is kind of true, uh, that touching between different casts, uh, seemed, uh, a little complicated uh, from what we saw in the answer. Uh, like when uh, Ruby was a little panicky after uh, accidentally bumping into Sapphire. Um, I do. I still do not think that it's that much of a deal to touch a pearl because they're seen as... They're seen as slaves. There's, there are possessions on Homeworld. So... Um, I don't think, because, yeah, we've seen the diamonds touch their pearls, uh, as much as they wanted. Like, even yellow, uh, carrying, uh, yellow and blue pearl in her hand while they sang. Um, so, yeah, I don't think it's that much of a deal, but, uh, the idea here, that, the, the idea that was used here is very interesting, Because, uh, not, not that much because of the, the touching thing, but because of the feeling thing. Because here, there's a pearl, well, who, who met a gem who's actually, who actually asked her for permission before touching her. And, and who kind of sees her not as a possession, but as... But as, if not her own person, at least of a being with her own will. Well, that's what I, that's what I gathered from uh, how she asked and how she was, and how there was a small, uh, a development between, uh, in the interaction between the two. And the fact is uh, that there was a precision that this is not love, this is just, um... This is the, this pearl's way of coping with her situation. She is a possession in the eye of, in the eyes of her master, but in uh, Chara, Chararite's eyes, she is uh, she is kind of a person. And playing pretend like this uh, helps her, you know, deal with her situation. And it's not because it, it's not because she likes uh, Chirites pr um, precisely. Like there, we don't know really who Char uh, who Chirite is. We don't know what her personality is like. We just know what type of gem she is, and that she considers Pearl a person. And that's what interests Pearl, and not what who Chirites is. Were it any other gem who act, who acted like this, Pearl would have reacted the same. I think that's what this chapter is trying to say. And I think it's kind of interesting that it doesn't fall into a uh, forbidden love trope. Like what we had uh, with uh, Rodonite in the Off Colors. Okay, I, I'll, I'll, uh, let's move on, because I'm rambling so far. Chapter 6, Powder Blue Pearl Sing, even if no one else can hear. Ooh, this is going to be interesting. There was a time where the cathedrals and spires and temples of Homeworld were filled with songs. That time has long since passed. Melodies have been replaced by more utilitarian, utilitarian sounds. Screaming drills, roaring engine fires... The rhythmic march of soldiers' footsteps. The beep and whine of technology. Most gems, the new ones at least, the ones who have only emerged after the end of Era 1, 
I've never you have never heard music. Never even heard of it. The older gems who do still know the concept are too wise to ever mention it. They've survived so long for a reason. They know they know how to tow the party line. Ooh. This pearl has not forgotten. She is one of the oldest pearls in existence. She knows better than to think that her survival is due to an exceptional skill on her part. She has been lucky. She has been assigned to good masters, ones lacking in cruelty and not needlessly concerned with presentation. She has not been shattered for some minor failure or replaced by someone prettier and shinier. She gets to spend long stretches of time in lonely, secluded areas, standing tall and straight as decoration for what few visitors may, that may pass by. That is when she sings. She sings old songs, the ones of times long past, the ones about loyalty and exploration and creation, O oh, stars of battle and solidarity, grand pieces, once performed in auditoriums, accompan accompanied by hundreds, by a hundred instruments and a hundred singers and a hundred dancers, now rendered small and mournful by her single voice. Mour mournful but still beautiful, Pearl thinks with a touch of pride. She does not sing for the simple joy of it, or at least not entirely. In the era's past, there had been a saying, the universe, dances to it the universe dances to its own beat, its own melody, and we must express it unless the cosmo falls silent and still. Pearl does not know if the saying is true. She doubts that the universe so wild and vast would ever stop simply because gems don't sing or dance any longer. She thinks it was only ever a metaphor, but she sings the own songs anyway, just in case. Oh boy. I really like the ending of this one. Note, I find it interesting from what glimpses we got in the answer, both Sapphire and Ruby, one of whom is a foot soldier, both seem perfectly comfortable with the ideas of music, singing, and dancing, while the modern-day Peridot doesn't even know what it is. Despite, of course, have built, built in perfect pi pitch and a natural grasp of the, of the technique. Me thinks something's up with the horrifying dystopia that is Homeworld. Huh, interesting. Interesting t uh, take on it. Uh, it is true that the gems sing and dance a lot, and I mean, it's also in how fusion works. Even though we've seen that uh, with Ruby fusion, for example, they just have to stack on each other. Or get close to each other, I guess, in the, in the, the way Topaz uh, worked. I don't know. I like the theory that um, that Homeworld once uh, knew a lot about music and singing and dancing and everything, and then it stopped. But I'm not sure if that would be true. But we know very little about Homeworld's past. We know very little about how it was uh, at the beginning. Maybe even before the diamonds were there. Maybe there, maybe there was a time where the diamonds were not the big mar matriarches of the gems. Um, I don't know if I'm going to say much about this, but it was it was nice. I really liked the uh, the quote at the end. It was nice. Chapter seven, lilac pearl, lilac, lilac. Silence is not always a virtue. Oh, okay. Trigger warnings. Now, obviously, almost everything involving pearls involves a degree of objectification, dehumanization, but this chapter is a little more extreme in that regard. Also, a trigger warning for ableism. Okay, uh, you hurt the man, woman, person. <laughs> okay, so we have now a pearl that's uh, apparently one of the... Uh, one of the ideal pearls, very uh, submissive and everything. 
and that pearl belongs to a spinal who apparently really likes her <laughs> Ooh, okay nice image here the pearls are all left in the chamber outside while their masters continue in they stand in neat rows still as statues until the final guest disappears inside and the glow from the portal fades and then, like a perfectly choreographed dance among the chaos, the pearls come to life. They break away from their perfectly ordered lines. They orbit around each other like stars, raising hands in greetings. Holograms flickering into existence, low, joyful murmuring. Pearl remains stock still, too overwhelmed to move. Won't they get caught? Her a moving form catches the notice of a couple of other pearls. One pink, one almost silver. You're new, says the pink. Nice to meet you. Who do you belong to? Asks the silver. Pearl opens her mouth, tries to answer, but no sound comes out. Nervous, comments pink. I understand. You're purple. Maybe an amethyst? Muses silver. Again, Pearl's, Pearl tries to clarify, but her mouth and throat aren't working. No, comments another pearl passing by, this one a blue, so deep she's practically black. I saw her at the side of a spinal. <laughs> it's nice to see the pearls interact with each other. I mean, in privacy. It's kind of a change uh, since last chapter we saw, you know, since last chapter with about, uh, Pearl culture, where everything, where all they did was, you know, uh, touch each other to signify some things. Maybe I read it wrong. I don't know. Why does, uh, why does, uh, Lilac, sp oh, why does Lilac Pearl can't speak? She tries all evening, straining, trying to force a sound out of her throat or mouth, but nothing escapes. She stands there, listening, dumbfounded, horrified. She is defective. She is terrified. She has never had any cause to speak before. It's never been asked of her. But that could change. What if Spinal asks her a question, wants her opinion, needs her to recite something she's over here or send a message? She will fail. She will fail in her duty. Let Spinal down, and she will be shattered. And it will only be what she deserves. No, 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 no. Okay, so she's mute. That's all. Uh, but that maybe I don't know. The fear hides within her, cycle after cycle, but the command never comes. And eventually she learns why. She's standing attendance at a small gathering, a collection of mostly spinals, discussing policy implement implementation. The discussion wanders, however, as it as is wont to do. Pearl does not flinch when one spinal points at her and says, I must say, you have trained your pearl beautifully. Thank you, says her own spinal, graciously accepting the compliment. Perfectly polite, the complimenter continues. She never makes a sound, never speaks. Spinal gives a laugh like the tinkling of breaking glass. Oh, that's not training. I had her built that way. She was built so that she couldn't speak? That's horrible. The renegade talks of her own accord, you see, Spinal explains at yet another meeting. More than talks, makes pronouncements, gives orders that's the entire problem somewhere along the way it became convinced that such things were allowed as long as we never give our pearls such an opportunity it cannot happen again at first pearl feels like she is breaking splintering into a million pieces then something hardens she feels whole she was made to never have a voice that she cannot change but she will not be silent she walks a little quicker down hallways, noticing the way her heels snap against the hard floor. Click, click, click. Her vocal cords cannot make noise, but she can still fill her chest with air and blow it all out. Whoosh! 
on those rare occasions where she's left alone or with another or with other pearls, she claps her hands together to show approval. Clap, clap, clap. She can purse her lips and whistle. She can press her tongue on the roof of her mouth. She will be heard. Note, when I was writing about a pearl who sang, I thought, what about a pearl who is denied having a voice at all? That was intense. <laughs> that was... Okay, this was an excellent chapter, especially when you, um, put, when you parallel it with uh, the Singing Pearls uh, chapter, as the author did at the end. It is very interesting that a pearl that uh, has been denied the, you know, ability itself to talk, to make noise, uh, actually finds a way to rebel uh, by finding what else makes noise in, in herself. And it's, uh, I really like the last paragraph. The endings of the these one-shots are extremely good. Um, <laughs> and I'm very admirative because uh, when I write, I can never end my stories, you know, with something that really, you know, pops out. Something that, you know, feels like a uh, grand finale. Well, here everything that is said is feels very uh very true and very you know moving it's really nice chapter eight pilgrimage summary make a mark okay okay so this is about some sort of secret storage in a um corridor back on homeworld and so, yeah, there are, there are a lot of uh, empty cabinets, and in one of them, there is a knife. Nobody knows where it comes from. Nobody would ever ask. All the pearls know that it is there, and that whenever it gets worn down, somehow a new one will eventually appear to replace it. Huh. Almost feels like an urban legend. <laughs> Every pearl who arrives on this planet hears of this place. Every pearl on this planet seeks it out at least once in their life. A pilgrimage. Every pearl takes the knife, holds it in their, in their hand, and carve a small line or simple mark in the wall. Simple, wordless. But still it says, I was here. Hundreds, thousands, countless of pearls throughout the millennia, all saying the same thing, I was here. The pearl will make her mark, put the knife down, close the cabinet door. She will trot off, poised and polite, and return to her duty. She may never come back. Whatever her fate, her mark will remain, for other pearls to see. I was here. There are no notes at the end of that one. I'm not sure, I'm not sure I know what to say about this one. It's really beautiful. Just... Just the idea of leaving something, something of your own behind at this place. Making a mark when your own existence uh, isn't considered um, of importance. No, it's nice. I, that chapter was nice. Probably not my favorite, but it was nice. Chapter 9. Black Pearl. Summary, The Power of a Peaceful Protest Ooh, we're talking about our pearl! <laughs> Many masters eyed their own pearls, seemingly quiet and docile, and wondered what would happen if they malfunctioned and decided to turn. One star Diopside, however, was a little more pragmatic. Everyone was overreacted about the renegade, so some pearl had been ordered to pick up a weapon and fight. If anything, it was simply a testament to Pearl's legendary loyalty and faithfulness. Oh no, trust me, it's not this. That one would follow their master onto the, a battlefield. The important thing in her mind was that Pearls could be skilled fighters, if ordered and properly trained. 
That was something useful. Oh, you're not going to end well, girl. This is funny because we're under the uh, we're under the uh, the point of view of a master here, not of a of a pearl. So here we've got we've got a master, Star D Upside, teaching her pearl how to fight, in order for her to protect her, and she still doesn't see her as, you know, her own person. But kind of like a soldier that could, you know, be of use. Okay, so now she wants her to learn how to summon a spear, just like the renegade, our pearl. And she manages to do it. The spear felt nice in her hand, better than the sword, actually. Pearl could see the beauty in it and her movements. The fighting sets she had drilled with so for so long. It was like dancing, only with the sphere for a partner. Or not, as an, as an extension of her own body, her own will. There was something comforting in, in the familiar steps, but Pearl could not imagine herself using those steps in an actual battle. Star Diopside told herself that her, that her Pearl would be ready if a situation arises. Pearl told herself that such a situation would never come, but it did. Rebels swar swarmed into the mountain temple. In the distance, there were screams and shouts and a cacophony of clanking from warning bells and weapon both. Star Diopside fled, Pearl running after her. Her master came to a stop before a heavy stone door, opening it with a mighty push. Sanctuary. Stay out here, her master ordered. Stop anyone who comes in here. Then she closed the heavy door behind her, leaving Pearl on the outside, staring at it. She made herself turn around, stand straight. Her gem glowed. The black spear materialized in her hand. She adjusted her grip, positioned her feet, just like she drilled herself so many times before. She waited, hoping that nobody would come here. Somebody did. It was a gem, but Pearl didn't know what kind of kinds, because they were one of these abominable hybrid fusion the rebels were always using. They were so tall, bigger than a quartz, muscular, carrying a massive axe in their hands. Fire seemed to burn in their four eyes, and all Pearl wanted to do was run. This is bad. This is bad. The fusion surveyed them, surveyed the spear in their hands. They were wary, wary of her, but Pearl was terrified. Oh no, oh no, 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 no. She should run forward, dodge the inevitable axe swing, plunge the spearhead right through the fusion's chest, just like she'd practiced a million times, protect her master, just like she had been ordered to do. But instead, the spear fell out of her hand, clattered to the floor, vanished. I can't, Pearl whispered. Oh, is she going to join the rebellion? Wow. That was nice. That was a nice story. That was a nice story about how a Pearl... No, about how a gem uh, sometimes could have joined the rebellion from not wanting to fight, you know? Not because they were rebellious, but because, because they didn't want, just because they didn't want to do uh, what, what their master told them to. Like, here the Pearl uh, does the same thing as uh, our Pearl, the Renegade. But this is not what she wants. She did not decide to fight. And this is why... And this is why she decides to join the rebellion. So she doesn't have to fight like her master ordered her to. Chapter 10. Red Pearls. Two heads are better than one. Sometimes. Ooh. Ooh, this is interesting. When Pearl hears that her master, Cinnabar, is ordering a second Pearl, she is horrified. I I sense the good interaction here. 
we're going to have envy or jealousy or are, are the pearls actually going to, you know, share a certain form of solidarity? She is not being replaced, it turns out. Cinnabar is simply being promoted and feels that it only fits that a gem of her station have two pearls. There is a symmetry in it, she says. In fact, the pearl she is ordering is the exact mirror image of her first, a clear sign of her satisfaction with the original. Pearl is not being replaced. Pearl is glad of that. But that does not mean she likes the new pearl. Ooh. I like the parenthesis in there. Pearl tries not to think about how, if the two of them are truly identical, she must have been the same at first. I like those little, those little parentheses that, you know, reflect what Pearl thinks. Or doesn't think in that case. Or tries not to think about in that case. <laughs> and the other Pearl cannot even get that much right. Her eyes kept, keep flickering from her feet to the ceiling, up and down the hall, towards her duplicate. Of course, Pearl only notices this because she keeps stealing sly glances herself, but that's beside the point. <laughs> well, at least she can sense the mood. She knows that uh, the other Pearl doesn't like her. Oh, 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 very nice dialogue here. I, says other Pearl. Yes, of course, only, only... You keep looking at me. You keep looking at me. They're the same. They're they're just the same. And oh, sorry, I'm not good at phrasing my thoughts. Oh, she's going to teach her how to, you know, be a good pearl out of you know survival instinct. <laughs> But I feel like there's some sort of sisterhood between the two now. Cinnabar gets compliments for their performances sometimes. The public, they appear in public, they appear unmoved by such compliments. But when they're alone, the pair will exchange proud smiles. Aww. Wow, they sure. That sure is going to be a show. Oh my gosh, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. Did the two pearls fuse? She carefully places the two bracelets on the floor and steps back. She runs her hands up her arms to her shoulders. On each, she feels a perfect sphere of a gemstone beneath her fingers. She looks at them. They are both red, identical. Fusion, she whispers in her echoing voice. She didn't know pearls could fuse, did she? No, she didn't. Oh boy, now there's there's some sort of dialogue between the narration and the um and the uh, um parentheses. How would anyone have ever found out? Why would anyone need a pearl fusion? Who would have ever given any pearls the opportunity? Perhaps she, they, she is the first. There's a rush of something, amazement, joy, giddiness, but also fear, worry. This almost certainly is not allowed. We can't stay like this, she says, and her voice is filled with sorrow, which is ridiculous. She shouldn't be sad. She's no different, not really. Pearl and Pearl are identical after all. Nothing truly changed with the fusion. Nothing was created. Nothing will be lost. But neither Pearl had ever felt like this before. So singular, so complete, so big. She can't stay like this. They'll be discovered. They still have to practice. But perhaps one day, the two pearls, perhaps they'll create her again. Wow. Okay, that was pretty good. That was very good. Okay. That's right, folks. In this chapter, you get two pearls for the price of one. Two pearls. And if you order now, we'll even throw in a fusion absolutely free. Go well, stocks last. Cannot guarantee that they won't rise up against you in a rebellion. Only, uh, yeah, okay. 
Okay, okay, okay. That that was very that was very nice. I love how they went from rivalry to friendship, somehow sisterhood to, you know, being a fusion. That was ex that was extremely well done. I really I really liked it. Oh boy. <laughs> oh boy, that was that was great. That was really good. I don't think that's my favorite so far. I still uh, kind of like um, the. I I don't think I could decide for right now which one I like most. Nah, I can't decide, but that's all right. I understand why this is at the. This is one of the things with the most kudos uh, in the um, uh, in that fandom. It's it's really good. It feels really real, even though the the author does, obviously doesn't uh, have all the information uh, about Homeworld. Uh, but what they say feels like it could happen, you know. And it's it's just it's just overall a really good fic, and I'm glad I read it. And uh, I think we're going to stop at the tenth chapter. Uh, because it's been a while and I'm going to spend so much time editing this video, guys. Um, but yes, it is, it is very good and, uh, I think I will, I would enjoy, uh, reading more of it. Uh, so if you guys want to see me react to more of this fanfiction or maybe react to a different fanfiction, uh, please tell me in the comments below what you thought of this and what I can do to make better videos or anything or whatever or tell me about your date whatever i whatever you want to tell me <laughs> um and so so just thank you again so much for watching and my videos it means a lot to me thank you a lot for subscribing and allowing my channel to have more than a hundred subscribers it, it's really really nice thank you so much guys uh, and I'll see you tomorrow for another video. Okay, bye-bye!